All right, and we should now be recording. So the first thing I'll share with you is a link to the slide deck. Um, I am going to be sharing a lots of links and ideas in the slide deck. And so you're very welcome to go back and use any of the slides we have, adapt them, as well as to follow links throughout. So you don't have to worry about running, scribbling around and uh, trying to take notes or um, grab links on the slides as they pass through. You can get them on the slides there. So again, welcome um, for those of you that joined after the initial intro. We This is the Summer Astronomy Activities webinar through the Discover the Universe. Um, and whether you are going to be offering activities in English or in French, we've got your back. You can jump to the French one now. It's also starting and happening at the same time slot. We don't normally offer English and French at the same time slot, but here we are. Um, and we do have access to the French slides if you did want to offer anything, uh, any of these activities in, in the French version, if you're offering bilingual activities or something like this. Um, if you are new to Discover the Universe, or you haven't heard of us before, um, we are a national bilingual in English and French at the very least, free online nonprofit. Um, and our goal is to help educators teach astronomy by providing resources and training. So uh, we are really a train the trainer kind of model. Um, we are here to support educators of all kinds, whether that's informal, formal, um, whether you're a parent helping your neighborhood kids, you're a teacher in a classroom, a librarian offering summer programming, or someone working in other types of science centers or GLAMs, uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, we are here to help you with any of your astronomy needs. And so again, I'm gonna put the link to the slides in the chat for those that are just joining. Thanks so much. And my name is CJ Woodford. I am the education coordinator for Discover the Universe, and I'm happy to lead this webinar with you today. Um, the goal of what we're gonna be talking about um, is summer astronomy activities. And this is really intended to be an interactive webinar. So I'll, I have some things that I have prepared, workshops that we think are, and workshops and activities we think are cool that you could think about incorporating into your programming, whether that's for very young children or for adults, it should work across the, the whole span. Um, but I also am interested in taking questions. So if you have a question about an activity that I'm currently presenting, or you want to ask an extension question or anything like that, please feel free to put it in the chat. I'm going to try and keep up with that as best I can, or raise your Zoom hand. Um, again, this session is being recorded. So if you are not interested in being in the recording, you can stick to the chat and I'll read out your question and then answer it verbally. Um, you can keep your camera off, you can keep your camera on. It's completely up to you and how comfortable you are. All right. So the one connection I do want to highlight before we jump into the material, especially for anyone who is working in a library or in a GLAM, um, or you maybe you're just interested in summer reading programs, what have you, uh, there is a connection to the D TD Summer Reading Club. If you haven't heard of this before and you're offering summer programming, especially in space or science, I think this is something you might want to take a look at. Um, we're not partnering with them, so this isn't an official promo, but it's something to keep in mind. They are a national bilingual reading program with suggested books and activities for libraries specifically, but I've taken a look at them and I think you could really incorporate it into other types of um, youth, youth uh, programming spaces. Uh, and this is really to engage with kids over the summer. And the theme couldn't be more perfect to interact with astronomy, it's to the stars. And so Discover the Universe activities have the benefit of kind of working with the TD Summer Reading Club, not officially, but in a complimentary way because we're already science focused, appropriate for a range of ages and bilingual in English and French. So we're ready to be incorporated into your programming and I'm gonna talk to you about how. So there's three main themes I'd like to cover today. One of them is just getting um, kids and adults and patrons, what I, like whoever you're getting in your, in your summer programming, getting them out and looking up. What do you see in the sky? Why is it surprising? Why is it surprising to you? Were you expecting to see something that you didn't? Um, so kind of a range of activities around those questions and critical thinking and, ask, and asking those scientific questions. The next theme would be getting moving. So especially for activities when it's raining um, or maybe the sky is not cooperating with you in one way or another. It's very cloudy here uh, in Kingston today. So I feel it. And then the third one is doing some crafts and things that are a little bit more uh, hands on. All of these are hands on, but these ones would be like actively coloring. Um, and creating models and that sort of thing, which are also good for doing inside or outside. All right, so let's start with our first theme, looking up. 
So observing the sky allows us to reconnect with that sky and our place in the universe and our environment. It gives us an opportunity to get outside and actually observing what's around us. Um, it's a good activity, especially to disconnect from some of the more digital activities you might be doing and back into observing the environment. So this is a good one to do, depending on how your programming works, you can have a dedicated observing session. Um, you could have a series of sessions that are maybe short throughout the day if you're offering something maybe like a day camp, or it could be done if you have a group that consistently is coming back to your programming. Um, there's something you can do in the day or the night. And so there's lots of variations and combinations that you can piece together here that works for your specific programming. There we go. Some tools we're going to be talking about that you might want to consider uh, creating or becoming familiar with include things like the Starfinder, and we have an activity on how you can build one yourself, especially with, um, especially with kids. The planetarium programs and apps so that you can actually have an idea before you start your activity what to expect in the sky so you can help lead those discussions and maybe ask guiding questions. And we're going to be focusing a lot on our looking up activity guide. Um, this is an activity guide that is already available in English and French. It's for a range of ages, especially in that K through six um, age range. Uh, it's in terms of kindergarten through grade six, so like um, four through 12, but you can scale them up or down depending on what leading questions you want to use for each activity. Um, the main themes that you can think about when looking at the sky are things like the moon, the sun, constellations, and meteors. And those are the ones that we're gonna be focusing on uh, for these summer activities. Although there's lots of other things you can observe like planets in the sky. So the first thing I wanna point out is Stellarium. Um, we've done a lot of work with introducing Stellarium to educators, and it's a really, really useful program. So whether you use the downloadable version um, that you can have on your laptop or your desktop computer, um, as well as a mobile app version, or whether you're using it in browser, it's a fantastic tool to actually showcase what's happening in the sky. And we've got tutorials available for how to use Stellarium in English and French. What I do want to show you is what the... Um, what the online version looks like very quickly here so that you have some idea of what that might be. So if you were to go directly to solariumweb.org, and I don't advise doing it while in this session because it does take up quite a bit of RAM and I'm only gonna be having it open for a second here myself so that my Zoom doesn't cut out. Um, but essentially what it gives you is a view of the night sky. You can set your time and date down here. You can play to have time move forward as it would, or you can pause to have a look at the sky in a static view. Uh, you can turn on and off things like the constellations, the art for the constellations, um, and so on and so forth. You can remove the atmosphere if you want to showcase what it would look like if we didn't have an atmosphere. Some cool things to explore there. Um, you can also set your location. So mine's set to Kingston because my computer knows where I am, but you could set it anywhere. So all you would need to do is zoom out and pick as if you were on a map. You can type in search. So someone said they were in Halifax. Let's have a look at what Halifax looks like. So now I'm in Halifax. I'm going to use this location. And that's my sky at 10.23 p.m. tonight. Um, I could change the time and date for that. But depending on what you want to do, um, you can change the time and date. And I've accidentally clicked on something, which is also helpful for Stellarium. If you're interested in a particular object in the sky, you want to explore that with the folks that are attending your programming, you just click on it and it'll tell you more. Um, so for example, you click on all these things. There's also the moon here. You can zoom in and out, uh, which is also pretty cool. And that's just on the web version. The desktop version has a lot more bells and whistles that you can change and adapt. Um, but this is a good one to have a snapshot of what the night sky might look like from any particular direction. Um, for you on the day that you're going to be offering programming. So that's Stellarium. Um, let's talk about daytime observing. Most of your uh, programs are likely going to be happening when the sun is up or in the daytime. Um, there are lots of things that you can do for nighttime observing if you're interested in hosting something that's in the evening. But you can also think about offering um, daytime programs that talk about what kids can do when they go home if they are up past the sun setting or during twilight. But in terms of things that you can actively do directly in the daytime, um, we would recommend things for nine and under would be the activity in the sky I can see, um, which is an activity that is mostly about what do you observe in the sky and drawing pictures around it. For ages nine and up, it would be how long is my shadow and the daytime mood. And so we're going to talk about each one of these now. 
All right, so in the sky I can see. So this is really great for younger kids, but you can also expand it for, to older students, or sorry, I keep saying students because we're usually um, very focused on classrooms, but in general, um, you can uh, scale this down for kids that are quite young, but you can also scale this up for kids that are older or even the general population, um, depending on what kind of leading questions you ask. So for most children's books, it kind of starts with there's the sun in the sky during the day and then the moon and the stars at night, but there's actually other things happening. And sometimes the moon is visible during the day. Um, and so this is kind of getting your kids outside with a piece of paper, which we've got things like draw, write everything you can see in the sky during the day, you give them some crayons um, and they draw what they see. So usually you're gonna have things like the sun is in the sky, there are clouds, um, birds, I see trees because they're very tall, like things like that, especially if you're going to be talking with um, kids that are quite young, you could get all kinds of cool stuff in there. Um, I saw an airplane pass by, like things like that, uh, which is all really cool. Um, but what, we're, what would be really nice for them to see is, especially if you go out on a day when the moon is visible during the day, um, that kind of highlights like the moon is sometimes visible during the daytime, not only at night. Um, this is a nice short activity. You can make it longer depending on the kinds of leading questions you ask. And again, depending on the age of the group, you can expand or reduce as necessary. Um, the idea is to have small groups to do this or the kids to do this individually and then come together and say, what did you see? Were you surprised? Um, did Were you expecting to see something different? For a little bit older, um, you can do things like how long is the, my shadow? So this activity is for kind of spotting how does the sun move throughout the sky and not only during the day in terms of um, moving from east to west, but also between seasons. So over the summer, the sun is going to be very high in the sky. Um, and this is a nice activity to do to showcase that the sun is actually moving from southeast to southwest in the northern hemisphere as we see it. This one is nice to do if you are able to have the same group for the whole day or for a couple of hours, because you can do a couple of observations. The idea being you go out maybe onto pavement or onto a yard, um, you set a spot where people stand, where the, a kid is going to stand, or maybe you have groups where they each have their own spot where they're standing. They're facing north away from the sun, and they're looking to see where is my shadow pointing and how long is it? So you need a measuring tape, some pencils and paper. If you're on pavement, this is really good because you can use chalk to draw where the shadow is. You can make it as fun or as long as you want, of course. Um, and the idea would be to come back out later, um, you know, after an hour, after a couple of hours. If you've only got an hour, maybe doing it at the beginning, middle and end of that hour and to say, okay, where is my shadow now? How long is it? Where is my shadow now? How long is it? And this is intended to demonstrate that the sun is moving um, casting your shadow in different directions. And as we get to the center of the day, especially solar noon, your shadow gets shorter and then it gets longer as it gets later into the afternoon. Or if you're in the morning, your shadow is getting shorter as it gets to solar noon. Um, so that's a really fun one to do, uh, to kind of demonstrate how the sun is moving in the sky without actually observing the sun directly, which of course is dangerous unless you've got the proper uh, direct solar viewing equipment. The last one I wanted to point out is daytime moon. Um, so in, in the sky, I can see, so you might be able to showcase that the moon might is really visible during the daytime, depending on when you actually do that activity. Um, but this one is actually supposed to put the students in the position of saying, okay, well, why am I seeing the moon during the day? And what's actually going on with the moon's phase at this time? And so what's nice about this is that the student literally takes a ball and it doesn't have to be huge, but you know, maybe something the size at least a softball, I would say, if you've got something a little larger, that would be great. It should be light colored because uh, that's going to be easier to spot shadows on. Um, but they're essentially holding it uh, to say, OK, how much of this ball is being illuminated from my perspective by the sun? And there is some that's in shadow. And it's intended to kind of emphasize that the moon, just because we only see the illuminated part, doesn't disappear. It's always a ball. It's always this. It's always a, it's always a sphere. Um, and there's part of it that's in shadow, which is why we can't see it, but they're literally trying to recreate the face of the moon with the ball by standing outside and positioning it such that they have the right amount illuminated. So this is a really fun one. Um, you can get them to create different faces if they like, but the point is really to create the phase that they're currently seeing. 
And all you need is some like colored balls and some pencils and paper to write down observations, depending on how in-depth you want to make it. So some timing, because I've been saying like, oh, make sure if you're going to be doing daytime moon or if you want them to see the moon, you might want to make sure the moon's actually visible in the sky. You can use Stellarium, and I encourage you to use Stellarium because it's a great software. But just so you know when to expect that, so you can maybe think about when you might have these activities. Um, the first quarter moon is visible in the afternoon and the early evening. So if you have afternoon programming that you want to use, um, sometimes that you might want to think about having them is around July 13th, around August 12th and September 11th. We've already missed June 13th, 14th, obviously. Um, and it's not that you have to wait explicitly for the first and last quarter. You can do slightly before, slightly after the quarters. Um, it'll be approximately the same time. It just the moon will be like a little bit more full or a little bit less full. Um, and then last quarter is visible in the morning. So you can do this for your morning programs if you have them. June 28th, July 27th, August 26th, and September 24th, depending on how late in the fall you actually go. Um, if you're interested in seeing, you know, I want to choose a slightly different date, what is the phase of the moon on that specific date for my specific location, I highly encourage checking out time and date. Um, they're a great website for looking at everything celestial, really, as well as the time and the date. <laughs> Um, there, but they are a great website to kind of look and see what's specifically happening for my location. And then Stellarium is another great pl um, planetarium software to see that in action, depending on how much research you want to do into it. And this is another um, graph that you can use if you need a quick lookup tool to say when are the different phases occurring? Um, when does it rise? When does it set? What's seen in the eastern sky versus western sky versus highest in the sky? And this, of course, leads into a discussion on the faces of the moon. So we have our own activity for exploring faces of the moon in addition to the three that I've already showcased. Um, we've got a good explanatory video and a PowerPoint presentation. And I encourage you to dive into those um, if you really if you want to do some activities focusing on the moon, because uh, it helps maybe get your head in the right space, as well as some additional material that you might want to use to either introduce the activity, to introduce it to your staff or what have you. The essential part here, however, is that we do have um, different phases of the moon. And the reason why they're visible in different parts of the sky is, be is due to the orientation of the Earth to the sun and then the moon to the Earth. We only see phases of the moon because we are on Earth and it's our view of the moon. There's always half of the moon illuminated by the sun. Um, but because we're kind of stuck on the Earth, which is in the center of the moon's orbit, we only see a part of that illumination at a time. So this is why a new moon, um, we don't see anything because we're only seeing the shadowed part of the moon. There's still half of it being illuminated, but it's completely on the other side of it. So we can't see it. The uh, waxing crescent, we're only seeing a very small portion of that illuminated side. Most of the moon is in shadow. First quarter, we're seeing the first quarter of it. The rest of the moon is in shadow. And then as it goes all the way to full moon, full moon, this is why the full moon's only ever visible at night. It'll rise in the evening but it's only ever visible at night because we're seeing the full face of the moon being illuminated, which if you look at the orientation, sun, moon, sun, earth, moon, rather, um, we can only ever see that from the nighttime side of the earth. And then likewise, as the moon uh, continues along its orbit over this 28 day cycle, we have the waning gibbous last quarter and waning crescent. Um, so that's a very, very quick introduction to the faces of the moon and why we see them at different parts of the day. But it really comes back to the moon is orbiting around us. Half of the moon is always illuminated, but because we're in the middle of that orbit, we can only see certain amounts of the illumination at a time. Um, and that's where that comes from. Again, more information linked on this particular slide if you like, and I'm also happy to take questions if anyone does have questions. So maybe before we jump into night and evening observing, I've talked a lot about things that you can do directly in the daytime um, with kids of various ages, and then you can also scale up to adult audiences if you want introducing phases of the moon and when to expect them, and then some dates where you can actually think about organizing programs around or close to such that you're actually hitting those first or last quarters. Does anyone have any questions so far about the activities or any of the science, especially around phases of the moon or visibility of the moon and other things during the daytime?
All right. I don't see anything coming through in the chat. I don't see any hands raised. But again, please uh, feel free to raise a Zoom hand or enter things in the chat as you have questions. This is really intended to be back and forth. I'm presenting some things that we've thought of, and this is your opportunity to ask how things might be adapted to your specific um, situation, or if you think if you see some opportunities for expansion into other topics, we'd love to discuss that with you too. So if there's no questions at this time. We'll move on to evening and night observing. So the same way that you can do observing in the daytime, you can also do observing in the nighttime. Who knew? <laughs> Um, but uh, in particular, for usually for summer programming, especially with kids, you're probably not going to be having programs that actually go into the night. Um, if you're offering something like a camp that is overnight, this would be these are to be some really cool activities to do directly with kids. But really what this can be is either if you do have evening programs, fantastic, you can use these. If you don't have evening programs, these are still helpful to introduce, especially to older children, and then give them the tools activity sheets or ideas to then take home and do on their own time. I know it's uh, likely that students or kids will do activities on their own, but you never know. There might be that one or two kids in, in your group that are really keen about it. And now they've got the tools to actually ask some serious questions and maybe they'll come back and talk to you about it the next day, which is pretty nice. So depending on how your program works, um, how whether you offer things at night or in the evening, um, or if you're only offering things in the day, you can still recommend uh, especially older kids to go home and try things on their own. And you actually do the intro activities with them during that daytime programming that you have so that they can do it on their own later. But what are some of these activities? So um, for younger kids, it's still in the sky I can see. This time, instead of you know the sun and the moon, you're gonna be seeing other things like well, the moon again, but also things like the stars. You can start talking about constellations. You can talk about meteors. You can talk about planets, depending on what's actually visible for you and your location at during the summer. Um, usually during the summer, we have really great shows from Jupiter and Saturn. So those are some great ones to do. And I encourage you to check out Stellarium on when those are going to be visible in your location. But also other things like artificial satellites and having conversations around satellites versus planes. Um, how high they are off the surface, that sort of thing. So lots of, so you can actually expand in the sky. I can see to much, much older ages as well, or you can keep it very simple for younger children. For ages 12 and up. So again, you know your kids best and, and your community best. So you might say like, no, I can do this with kids that are younger, or mm, maybe I should do this with 15 and older. That's up to you. But for us, we realize that these next couple of activities are really best for, you know, grade six and up or grade 12 or uh, age 12 and up. So the introduction to the star finder and the globe at night, but you can scale it down if you want, or you can scale it up for adult audiences if you choose. So the moon is your best friend for the evening sky. Um, all right, someone's just saying they've used star maps with grade sevens this year, and it was a lot of fun. That's excellent. I love that. Um, we're going to talk more about the, uh, the star finder here in a second. So hopefully it complements what you've already done. Um, but the moon is, is your best friend uh, for the evening sky for sure. Your waxing phases in particular. So when we say waxing and waning, and I've used that a couple of times already, waxing means that it's getting larger day by day. So you're going from crescent to quarter to gibbous to full. That's your waxing uh, side of the phases of the moon. Um, and those are usually what's visible in the evening. Waning means that it's getting smaller. So you're going from full to gibbous to quarter to crescent and then to new moon. Um, what's nice about the evening sky as well, because you typically are not going to have the sun Shining, it's a little bit safer to use binoculars and telescopes. It's less of a risk of kids accidentally looking directly into the sun with binoculars. Not that that ever should be a risk. Um, you definitely want to have the right protocols in place and not give tools to kids that you feel they're not going to use them properly. Um, but this is a great opportunity to break out those binoculars and telescopes if you have them. Um, and then the full moon, of course, would be a great one if you offer programming like late enough or if you want to offer a special program that's a little bit later. Um, this is a really good one to observe with binoculars. It's absolutely uh, incredible, especially also observing the moon rise, which is very interesting because normally we only notice the moon when it's already up in the sky, but you can actually use this opportunity to look at when does the moon actually rise? Um, moon set will probably be way too early in the morning to offer programs, but you can think about offering something for moon rise. Um, so introduction to the star finder. So in this activity that we've got in activity seven of our looking up um, booklet, the students would actually make their own. Um, and what this looks like essentially is a circular piece of paper and then they print um, 
a little sleeve that goes inside of it and you match the day and the time that you're observing and it will show you what you expect in the sky. Um, depending on how much discussion you have, it can take about up to 60 minutes. And again, this just requires printing two pieces of paper, cutting out the sleeve and then fitting them together. And then voila, you have a star finder. Um, I will show what this looks like in looking up. So uh, this is our booklet for looking up here. Um, this is our little table of contents. So introduction to star finders on page 35. We're gonna go all the way down there. Lots of information for you here, how to introduce it. And then the pages that you would actually print are this one and this one, if you were to print it yourself. However, I will point out that you can also um, get them for free from the Dunlap Institute, or one of our hosts that's in uh, Toronto at the University of Toronto. And if you order them from Dunlap, this is what they look like. Oh, my background's cutting off. But this is what they look like. So they say Starfinder. Oh, geez. Okay. And the idea is essentially like you've got a circle that comes out of the, that comes out of the sleeve. I'm going to turn off my background so you can see this. Uh, no background. All right, there we go. So there's a circle. And for the ones from Dunlap, they come more detailed or less detailed. The less detailed ones are more accurate for light polluted areas. So if you're in a city um, with lots of light pollution, you're going to use the less detailed one. If you're out somewhere that actually doesn't have a lot of light pollution, it gets quite dark where you are, you feel please, please feel free to use the more detailed version. It's pretty cool. Um, and then you got your sleeve. And so this is essentially the put together version of what's in the looking up activity. And you just, you know, you choose your side, whether it's more or less detailed, you slip it in. And then what you're going to do is match the date and the time on the top here. So I'm going to bring this right in. Hopefully it will see it kind of visible. So we have our dates up here and our times down here. And so this is midnight right in the center. So if I were to view uh, tonight, say at 8 p.m., uh, this is June 19th at 8 p.m., I'm going to match the day and the time. So that's over here on the side. You can see there. Yeah, so 8 p.m. down here, and then I've matched it on June 19th up here. And so this is my sky tonight, the stuff in the center. And so I have my southern um, horizon here. So what if I was holding this, I would face south. This is actually north for me, which is messing me up. But if I was face south <laughs> and uh, I would say, OK, I can see things like Libra along my along my southern um, horizon. And then as you look up the star finder, so as you're you know going from your southern horizon and looking up, this is the center of the sky and then the northern horizon. So it's, it's kind of like this. You're looking at it like this way. Um, the yellow line in the center is the ecliptic, so that's the path of the moon, the sun, and the planets as they pass. So that so if you want to see if you can spot some planets, um, first check out the solarium to see what it looks like for you on that night. But then how to actually find them when you're out there, if you just have your star finder, you can say, okay, this is the path of the ecliptic. I'm looking along here for some really bright objects. And based on what solarium tells me, that one is Mars or that one is Jupiter. Um, so that's a really good one to do. This is also a great way to get uh, students or kids familiar with the different constellations that they see. And then as it gets later, you just rotate. You rotate the, the little circle and then it shows you as your sky evolves over the night. Um, so that one's a really good one, whether or not you actually get free um, star finders from Dunlap or you purchase them from somewhere else or you've already got them or you use the um, the two sheets that you can print and then and then paste together to create your own. They all work the same way. So before I move on, like that's a really uh, in kind of intense one to do with with students and people are always kind of like, how do I use a star finder? So I do want to take a second on this particular activity and ask, and see if anyone has any questions or concerns with using this activity, creating it with their students or kids, or if you've got any questions about using the star finder itself before we move on. Uh, Jessica, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so we use these, so I printed them myself and we cut them out and we use them um, maybe three weeks ago, four weeks ago, and it went really well. The students really loved it. Um, but I had, it was my first time using them as well. So I, I watched the video that Julie had made to learn how to use them. And we kind of learned together and we did it together and it was great. But I had a question about how 
um, it was kind of difficult to use them in the dark. Mm. I don't know. We we kind of had our, our flashlights pointed down to give us a little bit of light so that we can actually read the maps. Um, and we were in an area that was very, very low light pollution. So it was truly pitch black around us. So I was just wondering if you had any tips and tricks on how we could um, better see the maps while we're using them. Yeah, no, that's a super good question. One, fantastic that you were able to see them in a dark area. Um, most of the time where I've had the opportunity to use these, it's been high light areas, a lot of light pollution, and then you have no problem seeing it because right. it's light polluted. But if right. you are in an area that's low light pollution, which is fantastic, um, or even a dark site, you use a tip that astronomers use all the time. So don't use regular flashlights or your phone flashlight if you can help it. Ideally, you would use red light. So um, this is a so you can it's just a lens that goes over a regular flashlight. You can purchase these lenses usually in things like surplus stores or outdoor stores. You can get them a Canadian Tire, for example, and they just go over your flashlight and um, it just red tints the light. So red light um, will preserve your night vision. And so that you will be able to look at the maps and not be able to ruin and not ruin your night vision. Um, there might even be apps that you can install on your phone to have red light come out for your flashlight op for your flashlight option, but I'm not so sure on that one. Okay, that's amazing. Yeah, just writing that down so <laughs> so I know for next time. Um, yeah, that would be great because then we could just put them over a, a couple of a couple phones, and then we'll have and the same thing. I was pointing them down. Mm -hmm. um would we still be doing that as well with the red light well with red light you're not as concerned about losing your night vision anymore because of that red tint um so you wouldn't have to I and see. i definitely okay. encourage you to make sure like you're watching where you're going so and all that mm -hmm. stuff so pointing them down is probably still a good idea but typically what astronomers do when they're out in the field observing is not only red light but still pointing it downwards um, because you're then you're still reducing the light pollution in the area even though red tinted light will be much, much, much reduced than than um, all spectrum light that we have in our this usual white flashlight um, kind of situation. Um, it's still recommended just to point them down so that you're not scaring someone with this bright light, mm, depending okay. on what you're, where you are. Great, amazing, thank you. You're welcome. Um, any other questions that folks might have about the star finders or, or or the practicality of using them, as Jessica's brought up? Right. I don't see any more hands or things in the chat. I might also mention that um, if you, so the red light thing doesn't always have to be things that you buy. If you've got um, anything like a red film or red transparent plastic or anything like that, that you could put over a phone safely, that would work sufficiently as well. Um, if you're interested in investing, you can of course get specific nighttime flashlights that have the red um, filter directly built into them and then you've got it forever. All right, so let's move on to the globe at night. Um, so this is a fun one, a, a really good one that you can do with your kids during the day, like introduce the idea of the activity and then have them go home and do it. This is a really great one for that. Um, this is actually getting them to participate in citizen science where the kids are not just um, you know, doing observations or moving through critical thinking and scientific questioning uh, to build their own skills. They're actively contributing back to the science ecosystem which is something that, you know, especially depend, especially when they're at that age of, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, they're often not getting the opportunity to do. So this is a great one to introduce for them. Um, and so what happens with this one is you introduce, this one is actually uh, specifically constructed for you to introduce and then give it to them to go home. But the idea is that you choose a constellation. So either on your star finder, you say, okay, everyone's going to go out and observe tonight at like 7 p.m. or whatever, and we're going to observe um, I don't know, Draco, say, for example, everyone's going to observe that one constellation, or you might go into Stellarium and say, this is where it's going to be in the night sky tonight. Everyone's going to go observe Draco. And so you pick your constellation or maybe a few constellations, depending on the age of this, of the kids and how in depth you want to go. And then they go home and they go out at the particular time that you've all set. Hopefully the, the sky, the, the sky is clear. Um, and they observe that constellation. And what they do is they take note of how many and which stars they can actually see. 
chances are, unless you are fortunate to be in an area that doesn't have a lot of light pollution, they're not going to be able to see the entire constellation, or they'll see most of it, but maybe a couple of stars are really, really dim or just not visible to them. They then go into Globe at Night, which is a website um, where they can input that data for that particular constellation for their location at the time that they were observing, and it builds this uh, global map of how bad the light pollution is across the surface of the Earth. Um, so not only do they get to do a little bit of practice with their star finder, or maybe a little bit of practice with Stellarium and learning a little bit about the constellations and where they are and observing, they also get to contribute back and say, this is how bad the light pollution is in my area. And this is another data point for Globe at Night. Um, so that's a really, really good one to do, especially if you are in a situation where you can work with the kids during the day and then ask them to go home and do some observing on their own. Um, these are some cool summer stars and constellations you can particularly point out or highlight um, in these discussions. So I said Draco, which isn't even listed here, but that's fine. <laughs> um, big ones like you can that you've definitely heard of before, are things like Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, um, Virgo, and Cassiopeia. Um, those are really common. Those are really bright stars in those constellations, which is why most people have heard of them or seen them, because we can see them even in very dense, uh, very intensely lit cities. So just a few there that you can reference. Um, no particular preference. You can choose ones that are visible for you. And again, exploring the star finder and exploring Stellarium. Um, I really encourage you to do that to check out what's visible in your area as well. Lastly is meteor showers. So this one is a little bit less structured. It's not the same as some of our other ones where we're saying, okay, here's some method and you need to have these materials and this is how long it is. Um, the me observing meteor showers isn't necessarily an activity. You could make it into an activity and say like, what did you see? Count the number of meteors per second you see or something like that. Maybe not per second, maybe a minute. Um, but this one, you could do something like that, but this one's really about getting out with those kids and just observing it. Um, just lie down on the ground, uh, maybe with a, a blanket or a towel or something like that and observe. Um, the idea would be to observe away from light. So when you're lying down, you shouldn't have any lights in your vision. So you don't lie down in a parking lot with lots of overhead lights around you. This might be out in a field next to your center or library. Um, and it's just to observe some of the meteor showers that are happening over the summer. Um, why do we have meteor showers? This might be a good opportunity to talk about that. So a lot of the times how people tend to think about meteor showers is that these big rocks come in from way, 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 way out in the outer solar system, and then they burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, and that's what creates meteor showers. Mm, not really. It's actually mostly that comets, as they circle around the sun, leave behind clouds of dust and debris behind them. They kind of break up as they especially get closer to the sun and then move away. And so um, these dust clouds kind of just sit there and move along with the, with the orbit around the sun. And as the Earth goes around the sun, it will sometimes intersect with these clouds of dust and other debris. Um, and it's these little tiny dust particles, these little tiny pieces of the comet that have you know, flaked off or broken off that create meteor, sh meteor showers for us. And it's why we actually know when to expect them and how many um, meteors you might observe per hour, say, or, or per night, um, because we're actually moving into a well-defined cloud of this stuff. And so the one over the summer that we want to just kind of like emphasize is the Perseids. Um, it's supposed to peak between August 11th and August 12th. Um, it actually kind of starts around like in the middle of July and goes all the way until the end of August uh, is when you can expect meteors from, from this particular comet. Um, and you can actually check out some interactive stuff on time and date for the Perseids um, here. And so this one I have paused, but if I bring it back to the beginning. Oh, no, come back. There we go. So this is sped up, as you can see, the minutes are flying by. Uh, but it's showcasing, you know, these meteors that are passing through as we're as we're watching the proceed meteor shower. Um, and this is from my location here in Kingston. If you're in a different location, you might actually get a better show, which is pretty cool. All right. Um, some extensions to looking up. So in addition to the activities that we've suggested and then some of the um, you know, take home activities or what have you that students might do. You can also talk about the seasons. You can talk about the equinox, the solstice, um, the motions of the earth around the sun and that sort of thing. So some ideas that you might also incorporate into your activities or have as different discussions could be the sun energy from the sun. Why do we have more energy hitting the Northern hemisphere in the summer as opposed to the winter? How does that impact our plants and animals? 
the length of your shadow at different times of the day or year, which is a great connection point into how long is my shadow. Instead of doing it over the day, you're doing it maybe like over the few months. If you've got, if you're, especially if you're a teacher in a formal school setting, um, you could actually do this over the course of the school year and see how the sun changes, not just from east to west, but up and down in the sky, like how high it is in the sky too. Um, you can think about the inclination of the earth and why we have different seasons. Um, as well as why we have summer in the Northern Hemisphere while it's winter in the Southern Hemisphere. And if possible, view the sun with eclipse glasses. So many of you, um, well, many, many folks got eclipse glasses from Discover the Universe. They look like this. Maybe you have eclipse viewers. They look like this. They're squares or rectangles. Um, if you still have them, they're completely safe to use as long as they're not damaged. So you can go out with those with those kids and put on your eclipse classes and observe the sun just as if just as when you did for the uh, April 8th 2024 eclipse or are, are the ones that you've maybe observed so highly recommend uh reusing those eclipse glasses over the summer as you have clear skies the sun will be very active over the next couple of years so a great opportunity to go check out some sunspots and lastly uh we just missed the summer solstice um, in terms of this activity, it's happening tomorrow, so it might be hard for you to scramble a project or a program together for this one. But props if you do. Um, but check out our blog on the Aristosthenes experiment. It's how can you actually measure the circumference of the Earth with a stick <laughs> um, and a measuring tape. It's, uh, it's a pretty cool experiment. I highly encourage you to check it out and definitely catch it on the other solstice next year. All right, so that's all the stuff we're looking up. The other activities that you can think about are actually getting kids out and moving either outside or inside. Um, so you can ask them to emulate the, the motions of the earth and or moon around each other. Um, you can use, so for those of us, for those of you that maybe were part of some of our eclipse programming, you remember uh, these guys are little celestial buddies. Um, if you've got a hundred dollars to spend, you can get a set of the earth, moon, and the sun, I think they're a great tool to have. Look at the little face on the sun, ridiculous. Um, extremely cute. <laughs> and so you can give one to each each uh, kid and be like, okay, well, what does the moon do as it orbits around the earth? And the idea would say like, okay, the moon does one orbit per, uh, one rotation per orbit. It's tidally locked to the earth, which is cool. The earth does, you know, one spin per day, but that's also moving around the sun. And so you can get you can say you can add more and more variables to these depending on how old the kids are and how long your program is running um, but that's a fun one to do at least just to get the idea at the very basic level that the moon orbits around the earth and the earth orbits around the sun um, you can think about showcasing the orientation that the bodies need to be in for things like eclipses which are linked here and we've also got a sun earth activity that brings into that that brings into that um specifically looks at the earth sun system uh, which is which is very interesting and talks a little bit more about seasons and and that sort of thing and why we have day and night. The solar system to scale is another one that you could do that can even actually bring in your community. Um, this is using a app on our website called Scale Model the Solar System, and all you have to do here is enter how big you want the sun to be. So, for example, um, if the sun is an orange, it'll tell you approximately how large other things in the solar system will be, its diameter and the orbital radius. You can then scroll down all the way and say, okay, I want to actually see the orbits. Um, my map happens to be centered on Winnipeg, but if you're somewhere else, you can put it somewhere else. Um, and so, for example, you would scroll all the way into Winnipeg, and this is where most of my stuff in the solar system is, the Kuiper belt, uh, which is basically Pluto, and then all the way into the inner solar system, which is very, very focused on this foot care place, two souls foot care, love it. Um, where it's actually not that big for the orbits, but for the sun being an orange, it's actually, uh, it's pretty cool to set the scale. So you can use this to make it even smaller or larger. How big would the sun have to be for the solar system to fit inside this room? How big would the solar system have to be to fit inside this building? You can do things like that um, and play around with it. Um, and alternatively, what you can do is set the sun to some reasonable size object again, like a soccer ball or an orange, and maybe set up a solar system walk in your community and say, you know, in the middle of the library or in the middle of the school or in the middle of the community center is the sun and it's this you know special orange or whatever you might have and then um a signpost the appropriate distance away outside saying like this is where mercury is and then this is where venus is this is where earth is this is where mars is um and so on and so forth so that's not only a thing for the kids to do in your program but then you can also have some interaction with your community that's a that's an idea that i think is worth pursuing depending on the scale of your programming over the summer
So good to explore, but also good to get them out and moving. Lastly, I want to talk about doing some crafts. So not necessarily um, doing art for the sake of art, which is always good, but this is actually making crafts to learn about the science, which I think is really important. Um, the pocket solar system is a really interesting one. You literally take a little ribbon of tape or ribbon of paper about a meter long, and then you um, draw where the various solar system objects are on that meter. And this kind of gives an, an idea that not everything is actually in a line perfectly linearly, perfectly spaced apart. Um, our inner solar system is actually very, very close together and things get very, very far away from each other as they get further and further away from the sun. Um, so we do have our own slide deck here and you can actually uh, browse through it yourself, but I do just want to highlight that <clears throat> typically you put the sun on one end, Pluto on the other, the slash the Kuiper belt, and about halfway between the sun and Pluto is going to be Uranus. And then on either side of Uranus, about halfway is Neptune and then Saturn. And then you keep going down and then you've got at the end something that looks like this, um, where all of our inner solar system stuff is very close to the sun and then it gets further and further away as so you get further and further away from the sun. So that's a nice one that you can do as well. Um, you can also focus in more on the Earth Moon system. So we have one uh, activity that is a little bit about the size of the Earth and the Moon related to each other as well as how big our atmosphere is and how much water is on Earth. That one's a really cool one to do if you're interested in talking about um, Earth's resources and why Earth is special. We've also got a specific Earth-Moon scale to scale demonstration that's really great for lunar and solar eclipses. Um, and you maybe have seen this one before where you take a meter stick and you put a little um, ball for the Moon and the Earth on the meter stick and um, at the correct distance and it kind of showcases the scale of that system. All right, lastly, um, you can do the Earth, Moon, Sun models. Um, so you can kind of take any of these activities and uh, like have something where you add a little bit more flair to it, paint the Earth, Moon, paint the Earth and the Moon and the Sun, um, make some sort of paper mache stuff. You can do augmented reality, which is something that's cool from Plateau Astro. You can also book activities with Plateau Astro if you're in the Quebec region. So someone said they're in Montreal. Check it out. <laughs> It'll be really cool. Um, and there's always more out there. So in addition to what the TD Summer uh, Reading Club offers, which is very art-based activities, these are some more science-based activities that we've gone through today, as well as other things that we have linked here, like Plato planets, cards of the solar system, just that you have on the passive end, maybe just to demonstrate and showcase to your um, to your kids and your programs. So before we get into Engage with DU, I'm going to take a moment here and see if anyone has any other questions about any of the activities I just described. I realized I kind of ran through the last few very quickly. Um, but anything at all from looking up, observing the things that are around you, getting outside or even staying inside and doing physical models, walking around the uh, kids actually demonstrating what, what they're seeing, and then all the way through getting making crafts, so making scale models, coloring scale models, um, making things out of Play-Doh, making things like coloring things and that sort of idea to actually learn the science. Any questions or discussion that people want to have about any of those activities? Uh, it can be attractive to put signs on the roadside that says, for example, you are now crossing Saturn's orbit. Yeah. So this is kind of what I was saying with the uh, scale solar system. I love this idea. I would absolutely encourage everyone to think about that if you have the bandwidth <laughs> and the authority, I guess, to do that. Um, it can be really fun. So putting up little posts or putting up little signs. You can even think about making um, a laminated paper or an actual sign that not only says, like, you are now crossing Saturn's orbit, um, but you could have a little, little, some little fast facts about Saturn. How big is it? How far away is it from Earth? Um, a cool, interesting factoid about it, like it's hexagonal uh, pole storms, or the or, or the missions that have gone to Saturn, like Cassini, uh, the Cassini um, Pathfinder, like all sorts of cool stuff you can do with that and expand it. But yeah, I I love this idea of making a little solar system walk or solar system map um, that's actually physically there in your community for everyone to interact with, not just the kids that you're doing programs with. It can even be a fun game, like find the sun. <laughs> I guess people come in, they can find, you know, Saturn or maybe they'll find Jupiter or Mars. And then it's like, okay, well, you know where two objects are. Can you find the sun now? Can you try and uh, 
find where the sun is. I'm not going to maybe suggest offering prizes because that could get out of hand real fast, but um, all kinds of cool stuff that you can come up with from there for sure. All right, any other questions or concerns before we before we kind of go into the last couple of things here? All right, I don't see any hands and I'm not seeing anything come up in the chat, but we do have, still have a few more minutes. I just have a couple of things I'd like to mention to you about the programming that Discover the Universe does. Um, and so everything I've talked about today is actually also talked about in our most latest blog article, um, Building on Astronomy Fascination Post Eclipse. There's also lots of other activities that I didn't talk about that are geared more towards high school and like that older teen era um, that I encourage you to go check out the blog post and kind of learn a little bit more about what's available to you. And then everything we talked about today is also summarized there as well. Um, so that's a great one to reference. And I encourage you to stay in contact. If you weren't comfortable asking questions in this in this session, especially where it's being recorded, please feel free to email me at charles.discovertheuniverse.ca. Um, you have access to the slides. I'm going to put those in the chat again. And I really encourage you, if you're not already on our newsletter, to please join the newsletter. Um, and yes, so I mentioned this at the beginning, but I appreciate some folks join late. I'm recording the talk so that I can send it out to you and all of the registrants right afterwards. Um, but one thing I would ask folks before you drop off is please encourage, especially folks that are offering the TD summer reading program um, or that are working in GLAMS, uh, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, or in education centers over the summer, please encourage them to sign up for our next uh, webinars in July. Again, we're offering another one in English and another one in French. Um, so that they can have an opportunity to come in and ask questions or interact with us directly. Um, and then we'll have both recordings available after the ones in July for everyone to use um, as they see fit, those will be available on YouTube. Um, but yeah, to answer that question, they are available for you. I'm gonna send them out as soon as the process is later, the, later this afternoon. All right, so this is everything that I wanted to talk about and mention. I encourage folks to stay on and ask questions or if you had things that you wanted or um, anything that you wanted to add, I'd love to hear it. Um, but for anyone that does need to jump off and go to another meeting or start the next program at, at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, or maybe you're in the Atlantic region, or maybe you're in uh, mountain time or whatever, what have you, um, thanks for showing up. Thanks for being here. Uh, share the news, encourage folks to come out to our one in July, and I hope that you sign up for a newsletter. It's been great having you. Um, but for anyone who does have any questions, we do have a few more minutes. Happy to answer them. Yeah, you're welcome, guys. Thanks so much. Jessica, go ahead. Hi, CJ. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. It was great. I, I had kind of more of a specific question. I don't know um, if it would benefit everyone, but I, um, I host educational programs and we're trying to expand and do more astronomy. So we've kind of started with that this year. Thanks. And I was wondering if you uh, you have any resources because I'm quite new to this um, astronomy is not my background uh, so I was wondering if you knew of any resources that kind of um, how, how do I describe it like if I'm out for at, at a given a given night uh, like a resource of what there is to see in the sky that night or what is something objects of interest um, just because right now what I'm doing is I'm using Stellarium and I'm I also have the RASC booklet that has, um, you know, month by month, uh, what what are some interesting objects. But I was wondering if if there was something a bit more specific of, okay, it is June nineteenth tonight. You should be able to see X Y Z really clearly. Um, just just because uh, I don't really know all that much about astronomy at the moment. Um, so yeah, I, any help would be would be very uh, appreciated for for me no that's a those are great questions um so i think you're starting in the right place like stellarium is a great one to use because you can you know highlight your specific location and uh the times mm -hmm. that you might be out of serving 
and the Rask. I'm assuming you're talking about the observation handbook, like the, yes, the big yes, booklet. Exactly. Yeah. Wild to jump right into that. Good for you. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the observation handbooks are also really good, but very, very detailed and really for those amateur astronomers that are out doing like astrophotography. Um, right. So good for you for jumping into it. Um, the Anostellarium is definitely one I would I would suggest. I would also say it kind of depends on the kind of detail you want. Um, so I would recommend like these Starfinders are really good because you mm -hmm. can, again, you literally just select the time and the date and then you mm -hmm. rotate it to see what's going to be there in terms of deep sky objects, um, constellations and stars. Uh, if you're interested in saying like, okay, well, are there any planets? I would actually recommend going back into Stellarium and saying like, okay, what are the planets that are visible tonight? Um, and then it should tell you when they're visible. Okay. It always makes me laugh that the sun and the moon are considered planets in this particular program, but huh. we're going to run with it. Why not? Um, but yeah, so this is a good one if you want to look at uh, a day by day, but I would also recommend time and date. Um, okay. So yeah, so, so this, they have all kinds of cool stuff in here, the meteor shower, but um, they can, they have all kinds of stuff around like the night sky, the moon bases, the calculators. Um, they have maps that you can investigate as well. And so that's not quite as helpful, maybe. Here we go. Yeah, so I would I would, I would, would advise going to uh, time and date and checking out their nighttime. This one is uh, focused on my location, but you can change it to your location and it'll tell you what's visible. So for me, um, Mars rise and set in Kingston is gonna be at 2.30 a.m. Not helpful if I'm running programming. Um, none of these are helpful if I'm running programming. <laughs> But uh, that's how you can, that's another one that you can do if you want just kind of like that overview of the planet. So I'd say a mix of Stellarium and uh, time and date will give you the information you need. Okay, great. Yeah. Perfect. I'm going to put this Thank one you. in the chat too, because you can change your location directly. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, are there any other questions or comments that folks have before we before we end the webinar today? We're getting we're only a couple of minutes before the top of the hour. All right, I'm not seeing any hands um, and I don't see anything new coming through in the chat. So I'm gonna assume that everyone is content or maybe just a little overwhelmed with the information. I'll send this recording out as soon as it's done processing this afternoon. Um, but please feel, I encourage you to share the fact that we have these webinars. There's two more happening in July, one in English, one in French um, for uh, summer astronomy activities. And I highly encourage you to sign up for our newsletter so you never miss a webinar or a resource drop because we're constantly producing more material for you. And we have a lot of exciting things coming up in the fall for those of you that teach formal classrooms, as well as folks that are informal educators, such as in GLAMS and science centers. Um, so with that, I'll wish you a happy afternoon. And for those of you on the West Coast, I don't know if anyone was calling in from the West Coast, but if you were, happy morning. I hope you enjoy your lunch period. Um, and we'll see you next time. So thanks so much, folks. Uh, have a great rest of your day.